Live from Santa Clara, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering Juniper Next Work 2016. Brought to you by Juniper. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Hey, welcome back everyone here live in Silicon Valley for our wrap up of the Juniper Network's annual user conference live coverage from SiliconANGLE Media theCUBE here in Silicon Valley. I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman. And wrapping up here is Ethan Banks, co-founder of Packet Pushers. Moving packets, they're pushing packets, they're pushing boxes. They're all going software now. Welcome back to our wrap up. I wouldn't say they're all going software, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Well, sure Juniper's betting them. the ranch on NFV. Stu, great guest uh, coming on here. The CEO came on, um, and all, the, all the top dogs, some customers. Um, this is Juniper's continued transformation, some new messaging, digital cohesion, makes sense, things are coming together, all the piece parts are available. Package that up, last year was disaggregation. At the end of the day, this, the network's where the action is. Security's a problem, but this open, sharing thing, a lot of stuff, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so, so, so John, first of all, um, I'm a little disappointed I didn't have acronyms thrown at me all day. I mean, you know, when I go to a networking show, <laughs> I want to be talking underlays, overlays, Ports. Uh, you know, MPLS, you know, uh, you know, IPv6, if we really made that transformation. But no, I mean, to be serious, it, it was, it's interesting that, you know, Juniper really up-leveled it from the start here. We're talking about, you know, digital cohesion um, and, you know, security. So, uh, you know, we, we've been looking at security. Security has gone from, it's always been an important topic, but security is like kind of job one in IT these days. Money is actually being thrown, big money is being thrown at it, and you know, something that lots of companies need to make sure it happens. Uh, and you know, I, I thought Juniper had a, had a good story uh, that, that put together. I'd love to, you know, Ethan, I guess the first question I have for you is, you know, as a networking guy, does this hit the right notes for <laughs> you know, people in the networking industry, or is it a little bit too highfalutin? <laughs> So first thing, he didn't say digital transformation during that keynote. He yeah. said digital cohesion, which from a networking perspective makes a lot of sense because what is it that is gluing together all of the information? It's the network, right? And so what is Juniper Network's strength? It's that, it's building that infrastructure. And, and so the vision that he put together, uh, sharing digital cohesion was about let's get all of these disparate infrastructures wherever they are, whether it's our data centers locally or whether it's up in the cloud, let's make it very simple to put all of those data sources together, connect them together in an easy way, and now we've got a platform upon which we can share information. So digital cohesion, the, way, the, the, the takeaway I had was it's really an enabler for that digital transformation. It's digital glue would be another term, but that's mm. not as good as digital cohesion from a marketing standpoint. Yeah. But I mean, it does package it up nicely. It gives that North Star vision kind of feel. It is a bit marketing-ish, but it's not, it hangs together. Um, it's not over the top. Um, and again, it's not played out either. I mean, digital transformation is so played. It's one of the marketing terms that I felt made uh, made real sense, especially coming from from the Juniper Network's point of view. So I, I, I like that that element of the message resonated with me. Um, the security story is another interesting one because it springboards off of that cohesion vision and says, well, what if we take all of these building blocks we have mm -hmm. for security, and then we put them together uh, in our enterprises in our companies and uh, want to have a cohesive security strategy where it's not enough to have a, a, as the, the legacy security infrastructure, mm -hmm. firewall at the edge, that hard, difficult edge to penetrate, to get into that, what is now would be the, you know, the chewy middle that's easy to get around in. We don't want that. We actually want to have a cohesive security structure where we've pushed security all the way out to the edge so that that perimeter is now everywhere. That's a, that's a big I deal. I want to get you guys' thoughts on this because one of the things that jumps out, I mean, do we go to a lot of shows, we see all the conversations, different, different perspectives, obviously it's a networking company, now the glue layer, cohesive, but they have to win that 20 year battle, the Cisco install base, and I like how they're positioning themselves and they're being disruptive to that pre-existing market of networking, but yet, the future scenario of NFV and the, the, you know, uh, the, the, the scenarios they talk about with self-driving cars, all this new digital stuff, they have to enable. And the players that are doing that are the big cloud guys. Mm -hmm. And so the telcos are ripe for a product and services software to do that. And so I want to get your thoughts on the dynamics of that telco to compete with the pre other big cloud guys, because together they're one big cloud. And the second thing I'd like to get your thoughts on is, is there a social network developing in the security industry at the networking and inside the stack where the sh data sharing is becoming, as Jonathan Davidson pointed out, I like his, his view, a club 
there's an organic development going on where people are sharing and peering data almost, if you will, as a social network just to get more data. So thoughts on the how to disrupt the Cisco's and this notion of social sharing. Yeah, it, it's interesting because you've got this dynamic. On the one hand, there's a lot of open source, there's a lot of things where peers always want to talk as to what's going on. Um, I was at an event a couple of weeks ago and like Red Bull Racing was like, all these cool things we're doing. I can't tell you the order of magnitude of how many sensors I have. I can't tell you the order of magnitude of data I have because that's you know my you know differentiation, proprietariness. Um, and even you know we had one of the Juniper ambassadors on and he's like, oh, you know, security is really important but uh, mum's the word on anything else there because you know that's my business. So we're, we're, we still always have this dynamic of uh, you know sharing's good. You know we hear a lot here um, uh, about that. But you know there's certain pieces. You know what's important to my business. Um, and I think one of the th things I've been happy to see over the last couple of years is IT really sorting out right what is important for their business. What is the differentiation that drives what they're doing, and what's the stuff that they're just going to push off to either a platform or a vendor um, because you know. So spinning up email servers is not, uh, you know, something that you know is for you know other than a handful of companies. Uh, you know, differentiation out there. Uh, you know, networking um, is the, you know the glue for all of this, and there's pieces of networking that. And you think you like important. the software strategy that they have? You think that's a good strategy? Yeah, I do. Thoughts on that? Well, as far okay, so so if I'm a business, why would I spin up my own email server anymore? Mm -hmm. Right? It's way cheaper, more reliable, more consumable readily. I can swipe that card and go with Google or whoever that provider is. So, w what interest do I have in running an Exchange server? I, I, I'm a guy that ran a lot of Exchange servers so, back in the day. Yeah, a lot this has no value in that anymore. Uh, so well, there's a lot of blocking and tackling you do on prem. You got to load all this stuff up and push that to the cloud. You're saying just take that off the table. Why wouldn't you? I know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> software as a service is there. I mean, th these are some obvious wins that businesses can take advantage of. In, in, in the networking space, one of the things that I've looked at is when is it something that I need to worry about? When, when the whole you know, kind of network fabrics and SDN first came out, I was like, there should be a line in the sand that we can draw and say, if I'm above this line, I care about it. If I'm below this line, it's probably not something, you know, I'm not deploying enough switches, I'm not having enough change in my environment that if I want some of those services, I should just get network as a service or some infrastructure provider, host or service provider, someplace else that can give me that. I'm, I'm curious, Ethan, you, yeah. Well, the, the, I mean, there's trade-offs you make here. So if you're a business that has been used to running your own infrastructure for a long time, you keep all your services in-house, the thing that you had was control. And that's the thing that you see, that's what you give up just as soon as you begin moving those services up to the cloud. So you lose control over that reliability factor, you lose control over performance, and now you're giving up all of that responsibility to your provider, uh, and then just as soon as you need to have that control back, now it's hard, because you've got a black box that you're staring at. I can't, you don't have... You don't when know Google what policies are on there, you, you know, if it's policy-based, whatever, it, automated. If it's, it has to be are, in the cloud too, right? Sure, I mean, uh, the, the security functionality, compliance, reporting, all of that stuff, you were very, uh, very much relying on that cloud provider to, for, whether it's uh, software as a service or infrastructure as a service, to meet all of those requirements for you. And if they can't, what are you going to do about it? It's tough. You still are kind of locked into operations with those providers if you've committed to them and moved your data up. And it's not as simple as, ah. Well, I think that's the telco opportunity that Juniper has. They can go to the telcos and say, hey, you have on-prem stuff, you want to move stuff for economic reasons mm. and other operational reasons or business model, CapEx, OpEx, no problem. If you deploy the Juniper there, you can have the same automation on configuration and, and security in their clouds. I mean, that's kind of what I heard. Is that, did I get that right? Is that kind of what they're saying? I mean, I mean, that's what I thought I heard. There is some of that, sure. So if it's infrastructure as a service and you want to stand up a virtual MX router up in uh, Amazon Web Services, you, you can do that. And then you've got that operational control that's there. Um, you know, different case to be made for just what that infrastructure is on the back end, if the latency meets your SLAs and so on, that, that's a different conversation, but, but yeah. You, you well, an important one, we have a source, that I haven't reported on this yet, but they ran inter-cloud pings between Azure, Google, and they all have direct connections with each other, and the latencies are off the charts, different. Like, yes. really big, huge. So there really sure. is no inter-cloud uh, you end up having to look at an internet, somebody like that that's got pipelines into all of these different uh, clouds. And they got to be direct connections. And, and then you're relying on that cloud exchange service to give you that sort of performance and consistency that you need between clouds, yeah. I and mean, that's a big, I mean, that's inter-cloud. But he said also, Rami said, hybrid cloud's not going away, one of his predictions. Yeah. 
A absolutely right. Public cloud, super important. You know, hybrid cloud. You know, a absolutely. NFV, big bet. You know, pushing forward. Um, security will only grow. Um, e Ethan, automation was talked about a bunch. I think mm -hmm. you did a podcast, maybe the Data Knots recently, mm -hmm. uh, talking about that. I mean, I know we've been talking about automation like my whole career uh, right. in networking. So you know, um, it's about time, right? Now, right. now, now. <laughs> can we do it now? Yes. Now. <laughs> so okay. So so the big challenge here yeah. with, with automation and networking is that all the platforms on the back end are different. And so where we're at in networking as an industry and automation is we're at a point where we're trying to get to some standardization of interfaces so that as we uh, are automating, we have some predictable interface that we're communicating with. That's the, been the big holdup right now. Um, you've got uh, Cisco with one set of interfaces and Juniper with another, and every other uh, vendor with their own APIs and ways you can go about programmatically configuring that gear. Um, so we have movements like Open Config, the uh, Open Config group uh, of uh, customers that are putting together models, and the IETF is involved in this too, modeling what the network and different aspects of network operations should look like so that we have a standardized, predictable way that we can now apply automation techniques to. So it's not a little different when I'm working on my Juniper infrastructure and, uh, versus my Cisco versus my Arista. Um, there's some homogenization happening there. And that, that's a big win. That is really moving the ball forward. Wait, wait, we need, still need standards? I thought open source got rid of all that. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, <laughs> standards are huge. And what's happening is we're seeing the open source projects maybe leading the way, yeah. but then taking the lessons they learn as they put code out and feeding it back into the IETF. So for example, OpenConfig, they're not off doing their own thing. They are taking their models and working with the IETF to standardize those models and contributing their opinions about what uh, the models that the IETF are proposing should look like. Yeah, what, what about the other, you know, if we talk standards, you know, what, what about certifications? Juniper's doing certifications here. I saw a nice table of people, you know, grabbing books yep. uh, and, and, you know, really digging in on some of this stuff. Uh, you know, where, wh how's Juniper doing on certifications and what, what's your latest on kind of networking certifications? So certs are, they are the course of study that you will follow to make sure you learn the things that you wouldn't learn on your own. This is how I like to, to think, think about it. I've done lots of certifications over the years. And it puts you in a position of, in my job, I know X, Y, and Z. But I never know A, B, and C, because I don't need those for my job. My company doesn't use those services. Put me in a certification role, now I have to know everything. A, B, C, all the way through the alphabet, right through to X, Y, and Z that makes you more knowledgeable as a network engineer. So you know, Juniper's had for years a great certification program. They've got a, a, a ladder, they've got an excellent uh, series of books behind them, they've got uh, great testing, et cetera. It's one of the more mature certification uh, programs and ladders that are out there. And by ladder I mean you can start small and go as complex and detailed as you want right up through their expert programs. So yeah, there is certification testing here, and I'm not surprised to see a bunch of people taking advantage of it. It's, it, it's what you, when you're very serious about learning a specific vendor product very well, you're going to dive into that. Makes sense. I, I know one one of the things I've been looking at, you know, for the last couple of years is, you know, if you're you know, tr traditional, if you're a company that's been around for a while, Juniper's been around for decades, mm -hmm. you know, how are you interacting with the public cloud? Um, Juniper has a decent message there. They've got services that are fitting into the other environment. You know, we've talked to them, you know, at Amazon reInvent, we see them, uh, you know, at lots of these different shows. Um, you know, wh what's your take on, uh, you know, how networking interacts with the public cloud these days, kind of in general, and anything specific uh, that you've comments on for Juniper? So the trick is to make your public cloud experience seem like it's part of your private cloud. Um, mm -hmm. So that that that, that I, I want to poke at that because mm -hmm. you know our, pri our 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 current experience today for the most part sucks. Don't we want to change it? Don't I want my <laughs> private cloud environment to be more like the public cloud? Think about it from a workload perspective. Yeah, I want to be able to take a workload and move it from wherever it is to wherever I want it to be without the network getting in my way. And by that I mean I need to have good transport, transparent connectivity, and I also need to have security profiles that follow me so that when it's in my data center and I know exactly how it's been secured, that that security profile is going to follow it up into the public cloud as well. And so when you're looking at networking products that will take you into the public cloud, that's a lot of what you're looking for, extensions from the environment you're familiar with to, uh, what, to, to have that same warmth and familiarity in the public cloud. Yeah, so so I, I guess, uh, let, let me just say, it. I, I understand I want to have policies that can be the same either way, mm -hmm. especially security needs to be able to span, view uh, that. Uh, what I guess I, I 
what we've seen from a lot of people is that the operational experience of the public cloud mm -hmm. is better today, and if I can have that kind of simplified experience in my own data center or my hosting environment, uh, that might be easier because today. So, so, so yeah. when you're saying network su networking uh, is, a, is a sucky experience, you're talking about just <laughs> just our operational well, experience you know, in the data center. Rom Rami gave the you know the note that the. the the statistic we've been quoting for the last 15 years, which is, you know, 90% of our budget is spent on, you know, the keeping the lights on, and we need yeah. to flip that. Right. And we can't flip that through little incremental things. We need to whole, you know, change the way we do things completely. So that's what I'm poking at. B but the challenge is in our in the in the environments that we own and the data centers that we own, where we have the responsibility for the care and feeding of the switches and the firewalls and all the rest of it that make up our data centers, we have been managing them in a same boring in tedious way for a very long time now, and that operational process is ingrained in how IT does what it does, and it's very hard to change that. It's not that we don't have ways to change that, because mm -hmm. hyperscale and cloud guys have shown us exactly how these things are done. Um, but 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 yeah. networking, it's for not example, as easy as it looks. No, that's well, your yeah. point. It, it's definitely not as easy as it looks. Yeah. You don't just download Kubernetes and all of a sudden start <laughs> mapping all of your processes yeah. to, to go with that sort of a deployment model. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to pick and choose your battles. It's you a cultural small. thing too. I mean, we hear the analogy like, treat, stop treating pets, caring for pets instead, think cattle. Sure. That's the the, the well, metaphor, we're, but that's we're, hard. But it, it's not it's not even hard simply from a cultural perspective. It's hard from an application perspective. If you want to treat uh, applications like uh, a cattle, that means you need to have an application that can be mapped to that sort of an infrastructure, yeah. and that's a challenge that a lot of enterprises have. They're running applications that were never designed uh, for cloud scale operations. Even if they don't need the scale, they might need that operational functionality, but they didn't build the apps that way. They built them in a monolithic way. That means they're standing them up on yeah. a, they're used to scale up, not scale out. Yeah. Juniper talked about self-driving networks, and we might have some of the same challenges that we have to get to self-driving cars. You know, mm -hmm. most of us were not ready. Uh, we understand that there's people out there that are drivers that we'd like to take off the road, just like I'm sure there's people running around data centers. We'd like to get them totally out of that job, but we're not ready to to totally just say, oh, okay, uh, automate all the things. Well, and, Stu, that's uh, a good go. point. And <laughs> to, to talk about what Ethan just said, it's interesting that the people are showing the way. So, for instance, if you told me, you know, three years ago that there'd be self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, I would have said, yeah, yeah. It's Sure, I'll give you 10 years, it's totally hype. Now Uber's showing some prototypes, Ford's going to ship in five years production, mainly around deploying, and it's happening now. Hmm. So mainly it's going faster. So people have to move faster, otherwise it's kind of, there's an inevitable point of, 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 of a forcing function. I think that is what I'm looking at here, is that the same dynamics exist. Well, if I hold on to the old way, because the mappings are hard, yeah, yeah, keep my job or whatever it is, clutching onto that, that, that old way. Someone else is going to just take it. I mean, that's kind of, I mean, is that a dynamic or is that my um, mixing the I th metaphors? I think there's there? some of that. I mean, I think there's some that just want to hold on to the way things are and they're resistant to change because they're resistant to change. But I think a lot more people, are, uh, particularly in networking, are coming around to the viewpoint of, wait a minute, this is just another reiteration of what technology is always about and technology is in a constant state of change. We are always moving to the next thing, whether it's as simple as, a, as an incremental upgrade or as complex as a, as a massive project that's going to bring about a whole new system into our businesses. Tech is constantly yeah. on the move and changing, and this uh, move where we're moving from uh, managing individual devices to managing networks as a whole and typing things in one at a time uh, on the command line to automating you know, giant swaths of our network, that's just another change. It happens to be a harder one, yeah. uh, and that's, I think, what's throwing a lot of people off. It's well, a scary one. Well, but Rami's point is, too, and my takeaway from that was I broke into the business in the 80s, and I remember, and I was young, what are those mainframe guys? They're so dogmatic. <laughs> and they clutched onto the mainframe so long, they would not change because, and the operating budgets on the mainframes, just on the support and maintenance, IBM, I would say they're huge, and DEC had a big presence in the minis, but they were kind of main, mainframes in my mind, was huge. They wouldn't move to the client server and then inter-networking that became that new world. So sure. is it the same <laughs> dynamic? I don't know, it seems to be the same. They're dogmatic, I'm the old way. 
there, there is some of that dogmatism. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, at Packet Pushers, we've gotten some notes from people who say, guys, I hear what you're saying about busting silos and don't just live in the networking silo, but talk to other people uh, in other groups and get to know your developers and so on. But I have a job description that will not allow me to do anything more than what I am doing. And so they have to talk about yeah. a cultural barrier. Yeah. Uh, some people are even legally bound yeah. uh, through contracts or federal law. SLAs, all kinds of compensation. <laughs> They're not allowed to talk yeah. to anybody. Yeah. else they can't and so that's that's a cultural challenge that's very difficult to overcome so sure there is some of that dogmatism great stuff let's uh, wrap it up let's go around the horn here let's get our take on uh, juniper's event here uh, ethan we'll start with you thoughts observations what's the vibe what's coming out of this show what's it's the, the second year for the event it's very customer and partner focused um, the information is going straight from juniper management to 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 the faithful uh, so you're getting uh, very strong messaging about uh, what Juniper is doing, uh, very strong security message uh, this time around, and it comes across as quite believable. So you look at what Juniper's portfolio is and what their goals are, and it makes sense. And so you sit back as a customer, you sit back as a partner and go, yeah, I can work with and that solution. And they're transparent too. That. They open the books so up, they show you everything. Very much, yeah, very, very transparent. Stu? Yeah, 34% uh, growth in attendance year over year. Uh, I th think, you know, pragmatic is, uh, you know, a word that we kind of throw at an event like this, but, uh, you know, with a strong message. I, I think last year we felt, uh, you know, Rami really energized, uh, you know, the founder's still involved. Uh, I, I've, I've seen tweets of him floating around. Uh, I believe he's the CTO now, but, uh, you know, uh, so good yeah. energy with the group, uh, the customers, partners, all you know, very you know, engaged and energized. So uh, you know, uh, really good to see. Uh, would love to see. You know, the, it's the the financials are trailing, uh, of course, because year over year, Juniper is pretty much flat. Um, but you know, the company, we think we've got the direction. Rami says he's got you know the full support of the board as to where he wants to take the company. And we we're, we've seen you know messaging got lined up, products are all getting there, mm -hmm. and you know the uh, the proof should be in the pudding. Looking forward to watching it going forward. Yeah, I mean, my take in watching it is I think they're doing a great job of balancing, um, maintaining that existing business that they have, and again, and while investing, but yet, talking about a new way of doing networking and the software approach they're taking kind of goes back to Pradeep's early, you know, over 10 years ago, he saw this vision. And I think NFV is the betting the ranch, that's my big takeaway, mm -hmm. that they're betting the ranch on NFV as that North Star and then they're going to get there with an investment. And the thing that comes again out here is I think they got the right sharing strategy. I heard Jonathan's comment about this club. I think there's going to be an ecosystem that's going to develop around security practitioners who want the network data, who will see value at the network layer and using that event data and other network data. So I think you know, they're balancing the current ship the core, speeds and feeds, get the performance throughput out, but yet offering that future path. I think that's nice. Versus the, we're groping for relevance and hoping mm. that the world will spin in their direction. <laughs> so it's a nice balancing act, and I think that management's got a good handle on that. So guys, yeah, I just want to give, give Ethan the opportunity, you know, what, what, what's new with Packet Pushers? Where are you guys showing up these days? Where, where do people find out more? So PacketPushers.net is home base for us. We run four different podcasts. We have the Network Break about news, the weekly show that's uh, aimed at engineers, uh, the Priority Queue, which is even nerdier if you want to dive a little deeper, and then Data Nuts, where we cover cloud and data center and all things about infrastructure uh, on that show. And again, PacketPushers.net is where you go for that. We're working on a YouTube channel. Coming up, we're going to be doing some video. And uh, yeah, a lot going on, a lot uh, of content. I, 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 vi video, and I, we interviewed Greg Farrow a couple of years ago. I said, yeah, video, you're, you're like the Howard Stern of networking, the king of all media. <laughs> um, <laughs> John, we've got a lot coming up. All right, Ethan, great to have yeah. you. This is theCUBE, we've got a lot. We've got reInvent coming up. We've got a lot of great events. IBM World of Watson coming up, and, and a lot more this year. And again, over 100 events for theCUBE. Still, we continue the, the momentum. Uh, this is theCUBE signing off here in Silicon Valley at Juniper Networks, Networks 2016. I'm Jeffrey Stu Miniman. We'll be right. We'll be at the next event. Thanks for watching. I remember when I had such a fan.